We're going to turn now to Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to um, read a fairly large portion because I want to get the context again, uh, because it's very important to the passage. We're going to pick up reading um, at verse 18. And then we will read all the way down to verse 36. And our, our passage will actually be verses 28 uh, and following on the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And so follow with me as I read. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah and others say that one of the old uh, prophets has risen again. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fear fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come now to your word, we look up to you, the author of Scripture. And we pray that you'd help us to understand this passage, its meaning, and its relevance to us today. May Jesus be glorified. May we be helped, strengthened in our faith. And we pray that you'd have mercy upon those who are lost. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, in our, our ongoing study of the Gospel of Luke, we come to the well-known event in the life of the Lord Jesus, what has commonly been called the Transfiguration. It's an amazing event. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three record uh, this event. It's perhaps the greatest revelation of the glory of Christ and who He really is that is given to us before His resurrection. And it is the greatest event, really, in the timeline of our Lord's earthly life between his birth and his death. Now, it's important, again, to see that this occurs at a very critical juncture in Jesus' ministry. You may have noticed that we have a very important time connection at the beginning of verse 28. It's not common for Luke to do this. Often, he, he, when he gives a, a scene in the life of the Lord Jesus, he doesn't really tell us, the distance of time between one event and the other. But here he tells us that this occurred about eight days after the interaction of Christ with his disciples, which we just finished considering. 
in verses 18 to 27. Now, both Matthew and Mark say that this happened six days after this. Uh, Luke says about eight days, and, uh, but there's not a real contradiction there. It's just the different ways in which days were sometimes counted in Scripture. It's a common thing that you see. It's six days in between, and it's eight days if you count the day Jesus spoke with them and uh, the day this event actually happened. And that's why Luke says about eight days. But here's the important thing. This points us back to the context leading up to the transfiguration, this time marker. And it's very important to us grasping its full significance. Now, you remember beginning up in verse 18, uh, Jesus had just had this very crucial interaction with his disciples. And in answer to our Lord's question, who do you say that I am? Peter, speaking for the others, makes the great confession in verse 20, you are the Christ of God. So these men have come to see and to understand who Jesus is, the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. But immediately, Jesus follows by telling his disciples that he must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, I think the part about being raised the third day just kind of blew right past them. <clears throat> what in the world is he talking about? But they heard loud and clear what Jesus said about suffering and being killed, and it was shocking to them. This was not the common expectation when it comes to the Messiah. Uh, though the disciples at this point had a, a more spiritual dis, uh, perception than most, it's also clear as we study the Gospels that they were still greatly influenced by certain common misconceptions about the Christ. The expectation in Israel at large was that the Christ would overthrow the Romans and establish Israel as a great nation, and there would be a time of great blessing and prosperity. And these disciples were expecting, no doubt, to be right in the middle of that, right in the, right in the thick of things as his followers. Or at least they were expecting the kingdom and all of its full and final glory upon earth to come now. But instead, Jesus tells them that he's going to suffer and he's going to be killed. And this is the first time, by the way, that, that Jesus explicitly tells them about his upcoming death. And it was shocking for them to hear this. And we see that very clearly in the parallel passage uh, account that we're given in Matthew 16. In fact, Peter even rebuked the Lord when he said this. Lord, don't say such things. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you, but it must happen. The Son of Man must, Jesus says. He uses what in Greek is called the particle of necessity. He must suffer many things, be rejected and crucified on the cross, so there can be no salvation. There can be no kingdom without the cross. But now, as hard as it was for his disciples at this point to fully come to terms with that, Jesus then follows by saying something else that cut across common misconceptions about the Messiah and about what it involves and what it means in this life to be one of his followers. He goes on to tell them that just as he must deny himself and suffer, if you would come after me and be my disciple, then you must be prepared to do the same. It's not all about glory and worldly prosperity. No, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. <clears throat> you must repudiate your own sinful, self-trusting, self-governing life, let go of it, trusting me to save you from it and to make you what I want you to be for my glory and for your good. And you must be prepared to follow in my steps down the Calvary road, to take up your cross daily and follow me. The cross of reproach and ridicule and the hatred of a sin-cursed world in its rebellion against God. And Jesus is saying, in effect, the glory, the grandeur, the triumph, the consummation of the kingdom is not yet. In the meantime, you must not expect that it will be easy to be a Christian. And you must take up your cross daily and follow me, whatever the cost. Now, why in the world would anyone want to do that? 
There must be some compelling reason to do that or reasons to do that. Well, Jesus has already given three reasons in verses 24 to 25. In verse 24, he's told us that losing your life for my sake is the way to save it. Verse 25, he underscores that nothing in this world that you could ever gain by living for yourself is worth the loss and destruction of your soul. And in verse 26, we looked at last week, he says, whoever is ashamed of me in my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory. But now as we come to the transfiguration, what we have here, I would argue, is a fourth an additional reason to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. Or we could put it this way. Jesus is going to give us a glimpse of why it's worth it to follow him. Now, I want you to notice the statement in verse 27. <clears throat> now, this statement is part of the passage where Jesus is discussing with his disciples. He just told them about his death. He's told them about the necessity of denying ourselves, taking up the cross and following him. And he's given already three reasons for doing so. But verse 26, what we considered last week about not being ashamed of him and his words, is not the last thing that he said on this occasion. He then follows in verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is still pointing these disciples here to something else to encourage them and encourage us in their devotion to him. But what exactly is it? Well, commentators have puzzled over this statement uh, for centuries. And there have been some weird interpretations that have been given. I'll not mention all of them. Most of them, are, I don't think, are worth mentioning. But, but one of the better ones is that Jesus is speaking of the present phase of his kingdom. When he says, there, there are some of you who are standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And he's talking about the present phase of his kingdom that would be inaugurated at his resurrection. Then some of those standing there would still be alive to see uh, the resurrection and his ascension into heaven and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and all of those events by which the kingdom of God in its present phase would be inaugurated. Now, I think that's an attractive interpretation, but though it may be partly included, I don't think that's really the main reference here. I agree with the understanding that what Jesus is referring to here is what was about to happen on the mount eight days later. Now, you remember Jesus has just spoken about the glory of his second coming to judge the world in verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, to him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes. He's speaking about his second coming, when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. And by the way, that's the first time he speaks of his second coming in the Gospel of Luke. Verse 22 is the first time he speaks about his death. Verse 26 is the first time he speaks about his second coming. Now, it'll be mentioned again several times, but this is the first time. Yes, I'm going to suffer, as I've been telling you. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified on the cross. And you too will suffer if you come after me. And you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. But the day is coming when I will come again in great glory and majesty and in the glory of the Father, in the attendant glory of the holy angels, and the kingdom will then come in its full and final and consummate splendor on that great day. But now it's as if Jesus says, but I want to tell you something, something that's going to happen to confirm this to you, to prove to you that you can trust me about what's going to happen in the future. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here, here who shall not taste death. That's just a common way of saying who will not die till they see the kingdom of God. Some of you, even before you die, you're going to be given a sight. You're going to be given a preview of my glory and the glory of the kingdom that's yet to come. I've just told you about the Son of Man coming again. No longer as the suffering servant 
no longer as the sacrificial lamb despised by men and crucified on the cross. But the Son of Man is coming again in glory. And to encourage your hearts, I'm going to give you a sight of this. I'm going to, uh, to some of you who are standing here before you die. Notice some of you was not all of them. As we read in verse 28, it was Peter, John, and James. Three of you are actually going to see the power and the glory of my person and of the consummation of the kingdom of God. You're going to be given a glimpse of it. You're going to see it before you die. And you see, it's then that we immediately read in verse 28, Luke says, Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. He makes this marker in this connection that Peter and John and James went up on the mountain. So this is the connection of this event with the passage we just finished considering last week. Os Guinness uh, is a fairly well-known Christian uh, social commentator or social critic. Many of you have probably heard of him. Well, some time ago he said this about America. We have too much to live with and too little to live for. Everything is permitted and nothing is important. Now think about that statement. Let me, let me, let me repeat it. We have too much to live with and too little to live for. Everything is permitted and nothing is important. There's a lot of truth to what he is saying when it comes to American culture. We are a prosperous nation materially. We have lots of stuff. Too much stuff to live with. Just look in my garage. And yet the average American has very little, if anything, of true value and lasting value to live for. And he's right that we live in a culture in which everything is permitted. An increasingly morally permissive society in which each man does what is right in his own eyes. Everything is permitted, but at the same time, nothing is important. People are yearning for something transcendent, something important to live for. God made us that way. And he made us to find the answer to that yearning in himself. But on the whole, many of our lives are immersed in trivial pursuits that in the end will mean nothing. And the things that we may in some measure place importance on are really not all that important after all in light of eternity. How few are devoted in their lives to something so important that they're willing, if necessary, to sacrifice everything for it, to deny themselves and even to give their life for it, if necessary. And yet this is what Jesus has been calling us to do for him in the previous passage. And now he's going to show us why it's worth it. My friend, is your Jesus and the salvation in him, is he big enough and important enough and glorious enough to overshadow everything else in your life? And to justify the willingness to deny yourself anything and everything that would keep you from giving your life unreservedly to him. Is he precious enough? And is the salvation that he gives valuable enough? And is his cause great enough to live your life, to spread his glory and his fame? Well, the emphatic answer of this amazing event on the Mount of Transfiguration is yes. Yes, it is. Well, as we begin to look at this in the time remaining we won't finish all of it, but as we begin to look at it, notice with me, first of all, the setting of this event. Verse 28. <clears throat> now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Notice three things here about the setting. First, the persons Jesus chose to be with him. It was Peter, John, and James. Now we might ask, why did he choose three and why these three? Well, the text doesn't say, but I think at least a couple of reasons can be deduced. First, because it's a principle of Scripture, first mentioned in Deuteronomy 19.15, but repeated in the New Testament, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, 
Every matter shall be established. So Jesus took three, because three witnesses is all that was needed. Three eyewitnesses who could confirm what happened on that mountain. But still, could he not have taken others? Yes, of course, if he wanted to. But obviously he didn't want to, reminding us that he is sovereign in all such matters. He grants special experiences of his grace to some as he will and as he deems best. But then if he desired three witnesses, why did he choose these three? Well, again, it doesn't say, but this is not the first time, is it? That these three were granted special privileges, and it won't be the last time. Uh, you may remember back, back in chapter 8, when Jesus went into the house of Jairus to raise his daughter from the dead, he only took three disciples into the house with him, and it was these same three, Peter, James, and John. And later, just before Jesus goes to the cross... In the garden of Gethsemane, he leaves the rest of his disciples at a place in the garden nearby. But he takes Peter, James, and John with him to the spot where he prayed. And there they were that night with him as he agonized in prayer at the prospect of the suffering that he was about to endure for our sins. Prayer so intense that his sweat became as great drops of blood falling to the ground. And these are the three men who were there. On that night with him. Why these three in each of these situations? Well, clearly there, were, there was a kind of inner circle among the Lord's disciples. And we could go into the whole question, the issue of friendship. You know, the Lord Jesus loved all of his disciples. But it's evident that he had, as a human being, as a man, as well as God, he had a special, more intimate friendship and relationship with Peter, James, and John. And even more so with John. He's sometimes referred to as the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, he loved all of them. Which reminds us it's not wrong to have friends and it's not wrong to have special friends, for Christians to have special friends. In fact, it's good to do that. Even the Lord Jesus did. But more than that, these were men who were to be leaders among the twelve. You may remember that Peter was to be the spokesman for the church. On that great day of Pentecost, he preached that great sermon in which over 3,000 souls were converted under one, one message. And James was to be the first Christian martyr, who certainly, being the first martyr, must have been greatly strengthened to face it by having witnessed this event on the mount. And John, the one who would remain and live longer than all of the other disciples, and therefore be able to bear witness to these events, even many years after all of the others had gone home to be with Christ. And there may be other reasons, but whatever the reasons, these are the three men Jesus chose to be with him. So much for the person. Secondly, what about the place where this event occurred? The text says they went up on the mountain. Now, what mountain was it? Well, there have been all kinds of theories and some very dogmatic uh, opinions about what mountain it was. But the fact is, the scriptures don't tell us. Therefore, it's not important what mountain it was. Now, I have read that there are, there are a number of mountains uh, north of the Sea of Galilee. Some of you have been there. Maybe you've seen them. There are a number of them north of the sea near Capernaum, where Jesus conducted much of his earthly ministry. Some of them get over 4,000 feet in altitude. And it could have been any one of those mountains, but it was a private place. It was a place where Jesus could be alone with God because it was when to see he was praying and be alone with his disciples in this private place on this mountain. And so then you notice, thirdly, what did he go up on the mountain to do in preparation for what was about to happen? It says he went up on the mountain to pray. To pray. Now, we've, we've taken note of this. Luke, more than any of the other gospel writers, is constantly drawing attention to our Lord's prayer life. And almost every time he mentions Jesus praying, it's right before something big and important is about to happen. In chapter 3, speaking of our Lord's baptism, Luke tells us that while he prayed... The heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. So that event where he was endowed with and, and empowered by the Holy Spirit for his earthly ministry. What was he doing that when that happened? He was, he was praying when the Holy Spirit came upon him. In chapter 6, before he selected 12 from among the larger circle of his followers to be apostles, we're told that he went out to a mountain to pray and that he continued in prayer all night. 
just prior to asking his disciples, as we read a moment ago, who do men say that I am? And before Peter's great confession up in verse 18, and before telling them for the first time about his coming sufferings and death, we're told that he was alone praying. And now before revealing his glory to these three men, what's he doing? He's praying. Indeed, the text says, verse 29, that it was as he prayed that the appearance of his face was altered. And I'm tempted to just camp here and to preach on prayer. I mean, certainly if the Lord Jesus needed to pray before all of these important events in his life, certainly we need to pray. The sinless son of God needed spiritual resources and wisdom from above for his human nature in terms of facing these decisions and these events and, and God's dealings with him in these special ways by his spirit was in the context of him praying. Certainly we need to pray even more, right? Whitfield in a sermon on this passage, he makes the following application. He says, was the Lord transformed or transfigured while he was praying? Learn hits to be much in spiritual prayer. The way to have the soul transformed, changed in two, and made like unto God is frequently to converse with God. And as Christ's garments became white and glittering, so shall your souls get a little of God's light to shine upon them by frequent prayer. Well, so much for the setting. Let's consider now, secondly, the transfiguration itself. What exactly happened to Jesus on that mountain? What did the disciples see? Well, as we look at what Luke tells us, I'll also bring in uh, some additional details provided by Matthew and Mark. All right. First of all, we're told that as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. Now, the Greek word here is heteron. And it's a word that literally means different. Other. It was other than what it had been. Otherworldly, we might say. Matthew says more, telling us that Jesus was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. Now, the word translated transfigured is a form of the Greek word metamorpho. There was a metamorphosis, a transformation that took place in the very appearance of his face. And you, you children know what metamorphosis is. You probably learned about that in school with reverence to butterflies. You think about that beautiful butterfly. Unless you already knew where butterflies come from, if you looked at it before it went into that cocoon as a creeping, crawling caterpillar, you would never imagine that that beautiful butterfly is the same creature. The metamorphosis is so great, so total, so dramatic. Well, Jesus' appearance was dramatically transformed. Matthew says that his face shone like the sun. It was not simply altered. It was illuminated with visible glory, a blinding display of light, not shining upon him. Important to understand that. It's not shining upon him. It was not light shining upon him from the outside. It was light shining out of him. Quoting from Riken in his commentary. Jesus radiated with divine incandescence. His deity shining through the veil of his humanity. As the disciples gazed into his face, they saw a radiant luminescence that revealed the glory of God's Son. And Luke also tells us that even his clothes became dazzling bright. He says his robe became white and glistening. Lucos, this is the word often uh, used, I believe, uh, to speak of the of the saints in glory, bright and radiant white. And the word translated glistening, it carries the idea of flashing or gleaming like lightning, to flash like lightning. Mark's account put it this way, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. No matter what brand of beach, uh, bleach, you might use. No launderer on earth could ever whiten them like that. Now, these are all just attempts, you see, to try to describe what was almost indescribable. 
And again, this is not brightness shining down on Jesus from another source. It's coming from Jesus and out of Jesus. This, this is his face and his person and his appearance radiating with divine glory. Now, as the disciples gazed upon the Lord Jesus, what were they seeing? What were they seeing? Well, first of all, they were given a glimpse of the glory that was always his with the Father before the world began. John 17, 3. His glory as God the Son. The divine glory that he had in eternity before the incarnation, before he became man. Though when he became man, he was still God the Son. Yet he had laid aside his glory, veiled in human flesh in a suffering condition for our salvation. But on the mountain, the disciples were given a glimpse of it. Secondly, they were also given a glimpse of the realities of a hidden world. The hidden world of God's heavenly kingdom. And this was also amplified by the fact that they saw two men appearing in glory, talking with Jesus, who were Moses and Elijah. We'll come back to that in a moment. But again, quoting from Riken, they were seeing what the poet Edward Muir described as the unseeable one glory of the everlasting world. There is more to reality than meets the eye. Beyond this world, there is a supernatural realm of spiritual reality. Quoting David Good Gooding, the effect of the transformation was to convince the disciples beyond any shadow of a doubt of the real existence of the other world, the eternal kingdom. Our world is not the only one. There is another. Next, they were given to see that that other world is not just future to our world, but concurrent with it, though also before it and beyond it. They further saw that though that world is normally invisible to ours, Christ had contact with both worlds simultaneously. And what is more, though he was still on earth, his person and clothes could and did take on a radiance suited to the glory of the other world. That's what they saw. And that's what God wants us to see this morning. And to learn from this, as it's recorded for us here in his word. But then thirdly, his apostles were also seeing something that was yet to be in the future. They were given a glimpse of the exaltation and the glorification of the God-man. They had been hearing about his suffering and his death. Perhaps they had failed to take note, as they should, that he also mentioned his resurrection from the dead. That his death would not be the end. After his crucifixion, there would be a resurrection and a glorification. He would rise from the dead in the same body that had been crucified. But at the same time, it was not to be entirely the same. It was a resurrection body that after 40 days would ascend to the Father, where he would take his place at the right hand of the throne of God, and from which he must reign until all of his and our enemies are made his footstool. And where he even now is, at the right hand of God, in all of his glory. You remember when John saw the vision of Christ? He fell down at his feet as dead. He was overwhelmed with what he saw. And it's from there he will return. In the clouds of glory at his second coming. To judge the world in righteousness and to be admired in all those who have believed. And we too who trust in him and have denied ourselves, taken up the cross to follow him, will be glorified together with him. Romans eight seventeen, And on that day, the two worlds will become one. As the hymn writer said, heaven and earth will be one. And we will enjoy then. Then we will enjoy for all eternity all the blessings and the joys of the kingdom in its full and consummate glory, ruling and reigning with Christ and serving him in the new heavens and on the new earth. In John seventeen twenty four, Jesus prays for all those who believe in him. And here's one of the things he prays. He says, Father, I will that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. 
that they may behold my glory. It's been broken down this way. We have a blessed location being where he is. We have a blessed association being with him where he is. And we have a blessed occupation beholding his glory. Just think about the glory of the exalted Christ. The glory of his person. No longer overshadowed by the veil of his humiliation as when he was on earth. But shining forth in all of the splendor of his glorified, exalted manhood. In perfect union with his infinite, eternal Godhood. The glory of his enthronement. The glory of his majesty as king of kings and lord of lords. The glory of his complete triumph over Satan. And over every evil and every enemy that has set itself against him and against his church. The glory of his holiness. The glory of his kindness. The glory of his love and grace. The glory of his worship. The myriads of angels bowing down before him and always at his call. The songs of the redeemed. Which John describes in the Revelation. He says it sounded like the voice of many waters. And like the voice of a great thunder. And we will join in with their song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Unto him be glory forever and ever. Just try to imagine, if you can, the glory of Christ in the world to come. And these disciples were given a glimpse of it on that mountain. The glory of Christ's person is God the Son. The reality of a hidden world concurrent with our own and the glory that is yet to come on the last day. Well, can we not sing with the hymn writer, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all. Is Jesus worth it? Worthy of our praise, worthy of our honor, worthy of our wholehearted, unreserved trust? Is it worth it to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him and to give our lives without reserve to him and to live our lives for his glory and fame, whatever the cost, even if it means death? The answer on the Mount of Transfiguration is a resounding yes. And we've just begun to look at this event. Notice thirdly. Those attending our Lord's transfiguration and their conversation. Now, my time is quickly moving. I'm only going to be able to touch on this part today. I hope to come back to it next time, God willing, into the rest of the narrative. But the disciples saw something else on that mountain. Verse 30, 31. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, there are two parts here. There are the persons who appeared and the conversation they were engaged in. I just have time to consider the persons who appeared this morning. And we'll look at their conversation next time, God willing. But who appeared? It was Moses and Elijah. In what manner did they appear? They appeared, it says, in glory. There was a glory about them, a glory in their appearance. Now, this raises a lot of questions I'll not be able to take up today, but some of them we just, some of them we just can't answer because we aren't told. How did the disciples know it was Moses and Elijah? Well, I don't know. Did they have name tags on or something? Of course not. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't have name tags on, but perhaps as they listened to these men discussing and conversing with Jesus, they were identified actually in the conversation itself. Jesus spoke their names. Or maybe it was by a kind of spirit-given intuition, and this was later confirmed as they listened in, and especially afterward by the Lord Jesus. We don't know for sure, but we do know that it was Moses and Elijah. And why was it these two? Again, we can't be dogmatic, because we aren't told, but we do know that the Jews... They refer to the Old Testament as the law and the prophets. Well, Moses was the great lawgiver, the hero of the Exodus, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt and gave them God's law. And Elijah was perhaps the greatest of all the prophets. 
It may have been Moses and Elijah because together they represented the entire Old Testament and all the Old Testament saints. But more on that, we'll get to that question in more detail next time. But the point I want us to see is that the disciples saw these men alive and well, talking with Jesus and with one another. Now think about it. Moses had been dead nearly 1,500 years. And Elijah had been taken up in a whirlwind from the earth more than 900 years before this event. Yet there they are with Jesus. And they're alive. They're not only alive, they appeared in glory, the text says. There was something glorious about them. So at this time, they appeared in pre-resurrection bodily form, standing with Jesus and talking with him. Now, again, there's a lot here and there's a lot of questions I hope to come back to. But what does this teach us? What did it tell his disciples and assure them of? What does it tell us? What should it assure us of? First of all, this tells us that after death, the believer does not cease to exist. And we don't enter into some kind of soul sleep, as some have taught. No, the teaching of Scripture, as confirmed here in our text, is to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross who believed in him and turned to him in faith, Today, today, you will be with me in paradise. And what a comfort this should be for those of us who have lost Christian loved ones. There have been a number in our own congregation who have gone home to be with the Lord. In recent years, they've passed from this life. Where are they? Are they alive? Are they conscious? Where have they gone? Well, my dear friends, praise God this morning. They are alive and well. And they're with the Lord. Something else we see here, secondly. These verses also show that after death, in the immediate state, believers have a relationship with God, and now also with the person of Christ, as we see here, and with one another. Moses and Elijah are talking with Christ and with one another. They know each other. They recognize each other. They engage each other. And I think it's also interesting, it's interesting to me that what they were talking about, they were talking about theology. Right? They're discussing the time of Christ's departure. His coming death for our sins, he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. They were anticipating it and looking forward to it and discussing it. And they knew that it was about to happen. Isn't that fascinating? What do those who have died in Christ think about, fellowship about, commune about now? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? What's Gina doing in heaven? What's Bruce doing in heaven? Who are they having spiritual fellowship with right now? What's Rosa's mother doing in heaven right now? Well, she's having fellowship with the exalted Christ. They are. And also with the souls of departed saints. Those who are longing for the last day. They're longing for that day when Christ returns to this earth and their glorified bodies will be reunited with their resurrected, uh, their glorified souls will be reunited with their glorified resurrected bodies to live and to walk on this earth once again. Perhaps they discuss this often. It will be a renewed earth, freed from the curse, but it will be the earth, Scripture says. The meek shall inherit the earth. God's will will be done on the earth as it is now in heaven. And there are indications in the book of the Revelation that the souls of the saints are consciously longing and looking forward to that day. What an encouragement for these disciples to actually see these Old Testament saints alive and well. And what a wonderful reminder that the Christian need never fear death. Even if faithfulness to Christ costs you everything, even if it leads to martyrdom as it did to at least two of these three disciples, 
death is but the passageway to glory. Listen to J.C. Ryle commenting on this. Let us take comfort in the blessed thought that there is a resurrection and a life to come. All is not over when the last breath is drawn. There is another world beyond the grave. But above all, let us take comfort in the thought that until the day dawns and the resurrection begins, the people of God are safe with Christ. There is much about their present condition, no doubt, which is deeply mysterious. But let it suffice us to know that Jesus is taking care of them and will bring them with him at the last day. He showed Moses and Elijah to his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he will show us all who have fallen asleep in him at his second advent. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are in good keeping. They are not lost, but gone before. But in closing this morning, what does this say to those of you who are outside of Christ? What will happen to you when you die? Those of you who are determined to save your own sinful, self-trusting, self-protecting, self-governed life. Refusing to turn to Christ in faith and to take up the cross and follow him. Living for yourself. Seeking happiness and security in the fleeting, moth-eaten treasures and hollow praises and temporary pleasures of a sin-cursed world. What will happen to you when you die? Well, it won't be soul sleep for you either. But oh, how you will wish that it were. It won't be annihilation. The scriptures teach that those who die without Christ, like the man in our Lord's parable of the rich man and Lazarus, that they will immediately lift up the eyes of their soul in hell, being in torments. And they too will be conscious and aware. They'll be aware of all that they could have had. Aware of how foolish they were and how they wasted their life. And they will have nothing to look forward to on the last day, but an increase of their misery when both body and soul are reunited to be cast into the lake of fire forever. How is it with you, my friend? Don't be deceived by the lie that this world is all that there is. Don't be deceived by that. It's a lie. There is more than meets the eye. And what really matters most is where will you spend eternity? And what will determine where you spend eternity is what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. May God grant that you will turn to him, repent of going your own way and run to him and cast yourself upon him for mercy and he will have mercy upon you and he will pardon all of your iniquities and he will save you and he will keep you forever. Well, let's pray together as we prepare for the Lord's table. Our Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the things that are revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. May we be comforted by them. And we know today that these blessings have come to us, both our present and future blessings, because of the death that Jesus died for us on the cross. And so as we observe this ordinance that Christ has established for his church, may we indeed remember his death. And may we indeed have communion with him at the table by faith. May our taking the bread and the drink into our hands and into our mouths, may we at the same time and indeed always be taking him and applying to ourselves what he accomplished for us 
on the cross. Because you have given us the right to do that. You've commanded us to do that. You've exhorted us. You've invited us to come to Jesus Christ and partake of him by faith that we might live and indeed live forever. So help us in a renewed way to do that today as we observe the outward symbols of his broken body and his shed blood. We ask it in Jesus' name.